Welcome everyone this evening. Um, I'm just going to give a bit of a talk about um, me, uh, Heritage Graziers, um, and how we got into livestock and how we do grazing. Um, so we started, uh, my wife and I, uh, about fifth, when was that, 2015, so about seven, eight years ago, uh, with seven cows. We are first generation farmers um, in the Cotswolds, um, so we don't have a family farm. In fact, we don't own any land. We've got a large garden at the back and that was it. Um, both wanted to get livestock, both wanted to manage livestock. Couldn't find, you know, just couldn't, off, couldn't afford to buy a farm, um, particularly in the Cotswolds. Um, so we ended up coming across conservation grazing um, as a way of um, having land to manage, to be able to keep livestock. Um, and we went from there, um, started with the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, and various pri private landowners in the Cotswolds. And there are a fair few kind of very species rich wildflower meadows in private ownership in the Cotswolds um, and they need grazing. Um, so we kind of started offering a service to them um, and ended up kind of building up from there. Everything was mobile um, at the beginning. So, well, it still is. So all our kit um, fits in the back of a trailer. Um, and gets moved by hand. In those first few years, those first couple of years, um, we were moving between about four or five different um, sites, different contracts, um, and all the handling equipment, as well as all the sheep and cattle, um, would go as part of that. Um, and I can tell you, moving those yokes by hand um, is not an easy thing to do. They are not light at all. Um, which is kind of their point, but um, it does make things very hard work. So we kind of did the hard graft for a couple of years. Um, and then about two years ago, we were approached by um, an estate um, up near kind of between Burford and Stow on the Wold. Um, it's an arable estate, so it's um, over a thousand acres, um, including kind of contract farming as well for local farmers. Um, they wanted to get livestock onto the estate. Um, so we moved there two and a half years ago now, I think it is, um, coming up three this summer. Um, and we graze across that estate. Um, so they've got 250 acres of permanent pasture. Um, and then the last, previous couple of winters, we've gone into their arable fields and done cover crop grazing um, to try and build soil health um, and kind of improve productivity into those arable fields. Um, it's 40 minutes from home, which makes it hard work. Um, I have a full-time day job. Uh, I say full-time, um, I'm four days a week. Uh, I do livestock one day a week and at the weekends. Um, Katie does all this checking on the days that um, I'm kind of at the office. Um, so it is hard work being 40 minutes away from home. We do, as of this winter, have um, another 120 acres of conservation land um, up um, over Cheltenham. So there's a triple SI, which is Charlton Kings Common and Leckhampton Hill. And it's a beautiful triple SI on the slope as it looks over Cheltenham. So we are now grazing on that. We've got a five year contract to graze on that. So between five kids um, and nearly 200 head of livestock, um, what are we on kind of three, 400 acres of permanent grassland um, and arable fields as well. Um, and a day job, it keeps us busy. Livestock wise, uh, we are running about 45 head of uh, British White and Carlson Montmore, uh, so British White and Longhorn cows, um, both native breeds. British White is um, obviously a rare breed. The Carlson McMorrit and Portland sheep, um, last count about 140 of those, and the number's always a bit up and down. Um, and we we bought those and we got those because of their native breeds. So they're a really good choice, perfect choice for conservation grazing um, and have worked very well for us. They, they can keep condition on or rather not lose condition too badly on very poor grassland. Um, so, so they've worked well. They also produce kind of that slow grown uh, meat, um, which we sell um, to customers. Um, so um, my wife works with a wall for the sheep. So uh, we'll see in a minute, she um, produces um, knitwear and hand home wear from fleeces or from the wool from the sheep. So having that brown kind of chocolatey brown color as well as the white which you can dye um, is very useful. The business we run, so we try and get um, as much from the livestock as we can do. So 
we sell meat. Um, we sell direct to uh, customers through our website, um, and that's high quality, um, pasture fed um, meat, all slow grown. Kind of, we are, and so we're going through kind of various certification at the moment, which we'll come on to um, later. We also sell direct to restaurants. Um, the, we were supplying a steakhouse in Birmingham. Um, unfortunately, got flooded out last year um, and the insurance doesn't look as though it's paying out. So I think they've disappeared. Um, but there's a couple of pubs we also supply. So there's that, there's the kind of meat side of the business. We also, with the conservation grazing, we get paid to do that. And um, that's as a service we supply for conservation grazing. A lot of the sites that we've grazed are difficult to graze, shall we say, um, hard work. They also are potentially poor quality grass, which requires um, the livestock sweeping obviously takes a hit on the condition on that. Um, and so that, you know, these landowners are getting paid subsidies to maintain these um, species rich environment, um, triple size or whatever. Uh, and so we kind of take a portion of that um, to supply that service for them to get those subsidies. It'd be interesting to see how that kind of changes as we change the subsidies and go into elms and things like that. Um, and yet we also produce other things from the animals as well. So we sell hides um, and sheepskins. Um, and we're looking at a project for the leather at the moment. We are working um, with someone who is doing tanning leather in a very traceable down to the individual hide way. Um, and that's a project that we are looking to do um, this year. As I mentioned earlier, um, Katie works with the wool. Um, she under a, her brand of Loopy use, she produces um, various things, knitwear on a kind of hand knitting machine, everything from kind of jumpers and hoodies um, through to kind of cushions and things like that. She also has um, some people, and they, she doesn't do the weaving, but they, they, some of the wool goes off into blankets and throws and things like that. Very much uh, focused on regenerative, um, well, regenerative journey through the whole livestock um, and that goes all the way through to the end products so um, the pale cream and brown sweater you can see there um, top kind of second from the right um, so that is a collect part of her collection that she has produced uh, last year that's got accredited with Fibershed so Fibershed is um, an organization that is promoting um, really kind of locally produced grown made um, textiles um, and that's all natural whereas um, there's no kind of added chemicals and even down to kind of the thread that sews on the tag um, has been kind of, pressed, kind of chased down for that amount of detail and traceability. Um, so the whole end-to-end -end products we provide are really traceable, very slow grown natural products. And I guess that's kind of our um, USP of what we're providing. We also, as I say, we do the grazing service. Um, so conservation grazing, a lot of um, calcareous wildflower meadows, very species rich, some of them. Um, the top left photograph there, you could walk 10 meters and walk over 100 orchids. Um, yeah, so really quite stunning, some of them. Um, and to do that, we do quite prescriptive grazing at times where need be. So the two other photographs on the top there. Um, they wanted to reseed a, a wildflower meadow. So it's not particularly species rich, that one, um, but they wanted to kind of reseed that top area. So we went in, did very focused grazing um, for a short period of time to take the grass down low, break up the soil. Um, the glorious Cotswold Grasslands team came along, um, laid out some, sowed some our flower seed and we then came back on I think it was for a day um it might have even been a half day I can't remember now and um, to try and trample that in and get that kind of those seeds worked into that area so kind of we will work very closely with landowners actually what exactly is it they're looking for out of their um, grasslands um, we'll do regenerative grazing so tall grass grazing on um, floodplain meadows so the middle photograph there is a floodplain meadow. The, um, it hasn't been grazed for a long time. Um, it gets flooded pretty much every year. It hasn't flooded this year, funny enough, but most years it floods um, and the soil health is probably not at its best. So we've gone in, uh, do 
very much tall grass grazing, um, mob graze through that, move, well, not mob graze, but moving every two, three days and looking at kind of 28, 35 plus days rest. Um, this summer, we went through that four times, I think, with the cattle. Um, and the idea, obviously, is to build a big root structure um, and then kind of eat, eat the top of the grass, kill off some of that root structure and build that kind of carbon, build that soil health. Um, and particularly on that floodplain, the idea is that it will then absorb the water when it floods a bit more um, and stop it running downstream and flooding the local village. Um, so that's kind of something, again, we were in discussion with a landowner about what they wanted for that particular site. Um, and just out of interest, that last one, a lot of the uh, places we graze have a lot of historic interest. So, um, you know, we graze, I think it's 150 acres of ridge and furrow fields, um, which is great. You, know, you can really feel the history, but it is a nightmare for putting electric fences up, particularly if you've got sheep, because you have to put a fence post top and bottom of the ridge all the way along. Um, so that's quite interesting. The triple SI we're grazing at the moment um, is... Is, there's a Roman settlement type stuff at the top um, and one of the tracks, the cattle walk up, um, the, the, I say room has it, according to the, owner, the manager of the site, there's two grooves in the stone where the cart, the Roman carts used to go up the hill to the top of the hill. Um, so it's, it, it's a great environment, really interesting places that we graze, um, which adds, adds value to us. Let's say we kind of do the prescriptive grazing. So um, we'll do anything from kind of the, the kind of tall, long grass, short duration, long rest, to kind of focus grazing to do a specific job, um, to mob grazing cover crops um, during the winter. A and we will set stock now. So we will we, we'll do what is best for the grass, um, best for the livestock, and also ultimately best for us as well. Um, and the soil so, uh, and nature. So, so really we are trying to work as much with nature as we can do with our livestock. Um, it does require a lot of fencing. Um, so everything is mobile, everything is portable. We work on a number of fields where boundary fences aren't great. Um, I've had for about three months over the summer, the cattle were kept in one field um, by baler twine. So there's baler twine zigged like, across a gap in the fence because I already had three energizers out on that field um, managing the different holes and different places and different boundaries. Um, so we do work with a lot of electric fencing. We use a uh, mobile water trough. So that's a solar powered mobile water trough um, to allow us to section up a field to graze it that particular one was to um, keep the cattle away from a footpath um, and not allow them direct access to a river. So that, that's hard work. Um, we are moving forward a bit. So one of the things that we have started this winter is we are using no fence um, virtual collars. So that was supplied by the Cheltenham Council on this triple SI. Um, and we are using those to section up quite a long site and be able to graze specific parts of it for specific times. We've also trialed that for doing mob grazing, so moving the livestock daily with those virtual fences. And for those that haven't come across it, and I'm happy to kind of talk about those questions at the end, um, it, the cattle get a audible sound when they get within about three to five meters of a virtual fence, which I control on my phone. Um, if they carry on walk, walking, they get another audible sound. And then after, if they kind of ignore the third one, they then get a pulse. Um, and if they actually carry on going, um, they will get another set of warnings and a pulse. Um, and if they actually eventually, I think they have to go through three pulses before they're officially classified as escaped. Um, but they can walk back whenever they want. So we found this winter, that's worked really well. Um, we had it took them about two three days to get used to it um, and the majority of the time we've moved them quite regularly so they kind of push the boundaries and test the boundaries a few times but to be honest if if we're not moving them daily I would be fairly confident that the majority of them would stay in for the majority of the time we don't use them as full boundary fences so we do have an external fence um, on, but it allows us to very much control and move the livestock around. 
We interestingly don't have them on the calves, so the calves don't have them, but that allows the calves to actually in effect creep feed and move forward over the cows um, and get onto the better grass before the cows do. do. Um, and that's worked great. And, it, and also the other benefit is because I can track them on my phone, um, when I get that phone call of your cows are out and they're on the cricket pitch again, um, I can just pop the phone up and go, no, they're not actually, they're, they're out and they're in the other direction, um, which is quite helpful because I've often had phone calls at various times of night. So that, that's been a game changer for us. The other thing that's been a huge game changer is uh, Kiwi Tech fencing. So as I mentioned, we use a lot of fencing uh, and it's hard work, particularly for sheep. If I'm putting out three strands of electric fencing for sheep, if I'm putting out just a 300 meter run, um, then I've got to walk that probably twice to put the posts out to so there and back, because I can only carry enough posts to get halfway. Um, if that, so maybe two or three times for the posts, and then I've got to walk a reel out and then back to get the next reel three times. So I could be walking that run, you know, five, six times. With the Kiwi Tech kit, um, I can take that out in one run. I can do 300 meters in one run. It all comes in that unit, as you saw in the video. Um, that was just running out a single wire, but you can do the same for three simultaneously at the same time. Uh, so that has been quite a game changer, and that will really allow us to do kind of more regenerative grazing, um, in particular the mob grazing. So we've only managed, because of the fencing difficulty, we've only managed over the last couple of years to either mob graze the cattle or the sheep. And they, we've done both and they work brilliant well, but it, I just don't have capacity to manage them with um, the normal electric fencing. Interestingly, and one, you know, the reason I'm here is so we got that through the Great Project. Um, so that is significantly a portion of that's funded by the Great Project. And we fund, frankly, wouldn't have been able to afford it without it. Um, you know, they've, I can't remember the percentage, but it was a significant percentage of that fencing which made it viable for us. Um, so we will now be mob grazing both cattle and sheep um, going forward on all the sites we'll work on. Um, so that's that's made a big difference for us. Um, and it's quite exciting to allow us to actually really do what we really want to do, which is really focus on providing kind of grazing for nature. Um, which leads me on to some of the things that I'm passionate about, one of which is dung beetles. Um, so dung beetles are kind of the, almost the worm's poor cousin. Um, there are keystone species that um, are great at building soil health. Um, they will you know, clear a dung pat on the ground. If you've got a really active dung beetle population, they'll take that dung pat down into the soil and will dry it out within a week. Um, which, if you consider what they're doing, it's clearing the pasture, so it's allowing your grass to grow more. It's improving soil health by taking the dung, dung down and fertilizing down. And you know, some of them, you know, they will go down and take that a meter deep, um, which is, you know, you just can't get that any other way um, but by getting someone like a dung beetle to actually take it down for you. Um, they'll also uh, dry out the dung so that you don't get uh, issues with pest flies. Um, and also they will kind of help with kind of um, their ferret, there's some phonetic mites that live on dung beetles that help with um, worm eggs and things like that. They're, they are struggling though. So um, the modern farming, the, the avermectins, the porons that we use are toxic to them um, and their impact on their breeding um, life cycle. So we are not seeing as many dung beetles as we should in this country and certainly how we help and you know, certainly how um, many there should have been. So, so I, that's a project I'm working on, uh, and it's something I'm really interested in. Um, one of the things that we do is we do fecal egg worm counts um, for livestock. So the cattle haven't been wormed in three years, I think it is now, um, because A, because we um, do a lot of the regenerative grazing is tall grass grazing. The worms tend to be at the bottom of the grass um, so we kind of avoid the worm burden wherever we can do. We're quite smart wherever we can do about not running over the same ground or at least this year what we're planning to do is in our rotation rather than come back within 28 days or 35 days whatever it is with the cattle we'll come back with a sheep and then the cattle will come back another 35 days after so it'll be 70 odd days before the cattle are back over the same ground and same for the sheep. Um, and obviously, if we're only doing the, the grazing the tall grass and, and not getting right down into the bottom of the grass, 
and they're away from worm burden anyway. That's something that we're doing and it's something that very much fits with um, what we try and do with our grazing. Um, as part of that, um, I've got um, a team of people together um, and produced, formed a group which is dung beetles for farmers. Um, so on that group there are farmers, entomologists and vet. And the idea is that um, we are providing information to farmers and livestock owners um, about the benefits of dung beetles, why they're important um, and how they benefit the farmers. Um, you know, if I'm not needing to use um, wormer treatment on the livestock, I'm saving money. Um, so how is it I can help the dung beetles um, by actually reducing the use of wormers which will then actually increase dung beetle population, which will then, the dung beetles will help reduce the problems I have with worms in the first place. So it's that positive reinforcing cycle. Um, and they're also, you know, the other benefits they provide that we've talked about, reducing pest flies, improving soil health, et cetera, et cetera. So that group is um, providing kind of pragmatic advice um, and suggestions to farmers um, at various conferences on site on farm tours and things like that. Um, and the main thing is through the website. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, um, please go have a look at that. Um, the other thing that we've done, which I alluded to earlier with farming with nature is working with the wildflowers, um, wildflower meadows, particularly with the amount of calcareous meadows that we've got in the Cotswolds um, and how few of them there are in the world. We have done some work with the Glorious Cotswold Grassland Project, um, which is part of the Cotswold uh, National Landscape. And that's so a number of sites we've been to, we've brought them in um, and they do uh, reseeding. They also harvest seeds. So one of the sites we're on this one we're on this winter, uh, we're in discussion with the manager of that site about getting the uh, guys in to actually take the seed off that and then kind of spread that in a, a nearby other meadows and, and trying to either manage or kind of create and maintain um, those wildflower meadows in the area. Um, so that's something that we've done quite a lot of work on. Um, and the other thing, so this was it's anecdotal uh, evidence, but it, it's the sort of thing that fits quite well with what we're doing. So the, the estate we're on at the moment uh, two, three years ago, had two breeding barn owl pairs. Um, last year, they did, um, we had someone in doing a survey, they had five breeding pairs. Now, we do tall grass grazing, that gives a really good habitat for the moles, mice, um, and other kind of small mammals, um, things that are prey for owls. Um, I can't prove it by doing regenerative grazing, um, that we've actually increased those numbers but it wouldn't surprise me if it's had an impact. Um, so those are the sort of things that we try and do um, with kind of nature um, and kind of help with the biodiversity. Um, we also, as I say, we do soil health um, and try and work with soil health. And we winter graze on two last, not this year, but the previous two years, we're on an arable field um, going through a cover crop um, and we've put, we kind of bale graze through that cover crop so then the cattle were having um, barley or hay bale um, at the same time as part of the fibre along, along with the uh, cover crop um, and that worked quite well we for various weather issues and curveballs we ended up running a bit short um, and so we would have always have this fallback which is a bale pod just tucked in a kind of corner of the field that's not used um, and we would spread you know, 40, 50, 60, whatever bales out, um, and then we would bale graze through that, um, allowing you know, the cattle in a small area. In effect, it's an outdoor barn. They're in a small area, but they get a new bale or probably get two bales every day um, and get into that. Now, the question you always get asked is, well, if you're bale grazing, doesn't it kind of wreck the ground? Doesn't it, you know, what happens? Um, the, that's a photograph in the same season, probably, I can't remember what it might have been the next, no, it would have been the same, but I can't tell you what time of year it is. I need to dig out what time, time of year it was. But as you can see, all, an awful lot of that hay has already gone down the grass um, and other kind of pasture is coming up. Um, and you know, it will 
drop down, improve that soil health, um, and increase the kind of productivity of the field. Um, this year, we are on the conservation site. Um, so this is a, it's actually a layback field. So it's not triple SI, the triple SI runs um, down the back by the trees there. Um, but we are bale grazing through this kind of layback field. It does, it is fairly species rich. So it's not your typical ryegrass field. Um, and there's quite a lot of biodiversity in that. That's very species rich hay that's being laid out there. Um, and so hopefully that will be improving um, the kind of the sward in those fields. Um, and so that's kind of where we are this winter. Um, coming just towards the end a little bit more. So hopefully I've given you an idea of kind of how we started, um, why we started, um, how we kind of run our business um, and what's important to us. Um, and I guess this is where we're going next um, as a business. So livestock wise, um, we've grown the herd. Um, we are, we're in a share farming agreement with the landowner at the moment. He owns a percentage of the cows. Um, and that's something that we've used as a way to kind of build that herd without having to kind of invest all the capital investment. Um, and that's something that is ongoing. Um, and we're obviously in discussions with that. With the livestock we've got um, and the rare breeds, so three out of four of the breeds are rare breeds, um, high health status is a really obvious thing for us to do. Um, it is not the cheapest thing in the world to do. And at the moment, I'm not convinced there is a financial benefit to doing it. Um, but it's the, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, so that's something we're in discussion with our vet at the moment. At the moment and that's something we'd like to start implementing. And we've done as a um, BVD stamp it out, uh, BVD free stamp it out program we've done. Um, and there are some other things coming in the pipeline, potentially a TB one coming uh, where we'll kind of pilot that um, and try and kind of build up towards high health status. Winter grazing is something that is always of interest. Um, the bale grazing through cover crops had mixed success. Um, one of the things that really interests me is bale grazing through woodlands um, and whether there's an opportunity to do that. The, obviously, the woodlands actually offer really good natural shelter. In fact, where the cows are at the winter at the moment, um, we, they've been spent quite a lot of time in the woods um, and they have free access, even though we were kind of mob grazing round. Um, we would give them, um, we wouldn't necessarily back fence or virtually back fence um, and allow them access into the trees for shelter um, from the wind, rain and snow if and when it turns up. Um, so that's something that we're kind of always looking to improve. Um, you know, we don't barn livestock. It's not something we're ever interested in doing. Um, but also I don't like them when they're sitting on an exposed field um, in the harshest of winters. Um, so that's kind of one thing I'm always looking to improve. Obviously, I'm growing the business, um, you know, we'd like to sell more meat. That's um, something that we need to work on this year. Um, Katie's textile business is going kind of leaps and bounds, um, winning various awards and getting various amounts of publicity. Um, and I think there's, there's a few things coming on that, which should be very exciting for her this year. Um, we talked about um, certification. Um, so we're not actually organic at the moment. Um, we are looking at it, um, and that is a conversation that is ongoing. Um, we, in effect, the way we manage the livestock uh, is organic, but obviously the ground um, isn't ours, so there's a conversation to be had about that. Um, the estate are looking to go organic. It's not a quick, easy step from them, but that's something that we would very much uh, welcome and go along with them on that. The um, pasture, Fed Livestock Association. Uh, so we're members of that and we are going through accreditation. We have I've filled the forms in. We just need sending off and paying for really. Um, I, I'm a great believer in the PLFA. They are so they're based, their headquarters is in Gloucestershire, um, in well, it is in Gloucestershire and Cotswolds. They the kind of pasture fed concept of actually trying to really produce beef and lamb that is that is grown naturally and reared naturally um, really obviously works for us. 
the they do a lot around regenerative agriculture um and even the forum so there's a forum there that we are have been on so we are non-certified members at the moment um and that forum has has given me a huge amount of information uh, a lot of what we do around winter grazing bale grazing uh, bale pods has come from people from that group um so we kind of want to finish that accreditation again it fits very much with our ethos what we want to do um, and who we are and then various um pr type stuff katie has a habit of um managing to get onto the television with various people like alan titchmarsh um country file um, and Kate Humble and things like that so that's all gone very well um, and I suspect that will only kind of carry on going um, as we go through this year with um, the things that she's com coming up and then finally our you know I guess our real connection with our customers um, and not just the customers it's the people who are interested in what we do who see the grazing we do so the triple SI is on the Cotswold Way uh, I believe 100,000 people go along that path every year. Um, so it's been really interesting kind of to talk to them in person. But social media is a huge, huge important way of us being in contact with customers or people that are just generally interested in what we're trying to do and how we're trying to improve um, be it biodiversity, be it um, cons conservation grazing on a site, um, site we're on at the moment with the cattle has been grazed every summer for the last goodness knows how many years um you know we are not grazing it this summer you know it's not supposed to be grazed this summer those wildflowers need their their moment to do their thing um so it'll be really interesting to see how that goes and to be able to communicate that with people um so that's those are the key things i guess you know the things that are difficult for us obviously if we don't have a farm um, everything is a way away it's a drive away um we don't have um the vehicle so there's no tractor the you know if we have a problem we've got to work it out we've got to move all the handling equipment by hand um we don't get subsidies we don't get grants we can get some things so um the great project you know is, is a really good example of how we have actually managed to get support um in getting that that kit um, I say, which you know, is going to be a big difference for us and I us to really do what we want to do. Um, but also the great project do um, funding for courses and training as well, um, which is really interesting. Um, and so it's it's a balance. It's hard work. We've got to fit it in with our lives. Uh, it's something we're hugely passionate about. Um, and the more we do it, the more passionate we become and the more we get involved in the kind of driving forward or the regenerative the biodiversity um you know getting into dung beetles for example that's that's a project that i got into just over a year ago now um because the more we do this the more we kind of believe it and the more we're into it um and so it'll continue um and you know feel free to follow us on social media um and, and keep track of, of where we go and what we get up to um and that pretty much is it i think i think that probably covers us just leave you with that last photograph which is um, one of the walks we do. So the estate is say, uh, it's 1100 odd acres. Um, it is not set up for cattle or sheep, certainly not for sheep. Um, we walk from winter grazing to summer grazing um, across the estate. Uh, it's six kilometer walk um, across you know, bridleways like that through the woods. There are no fences anywhere near where those cows are or hedges for that matter. Um, that's half the herd that was the British rights moved a couple of years ago um, and that took us about an hour an hour and a half um, just to walk them and they are so used to being moved they will just follow at the call we get a bit excited when we let them out first off but once they've calmed down they will just walk for an hour behind me um, and with the kids kind of running around behind catching any stragglers um, and, and that's that photograph to me sums up how we manage and look after our livestock and that's me, I think, David's... Uh...